I would recommend uh, looking up. They did a, they curated a show several years ago called Supernormal. And the whole concept was, um, especially, it's probably even more appropriate even today with all the information, how easy it is to create things, um, you know, and, and the abundance of stuff that we have. And the basic concept is that as designers, you know, what is our role today? It's not just about creating. Um, it's also about editing and about curating. To be responsibility going forward. So all those designers were very important to me in terms of understanding the concept of minimal. Because early on, it was much for me about, oh, well, this makes things simple, and that's kind of the whole idea. And in understanding the designers, it was really more so than that. Now that I mentioned earlier, it was really about minimizing to, to discover, to make something more meaningful, to create something that's more purposeful, something that's more useful. Um, so don't minimize the details. I know I'm talking about minimizing here, but in terms of details, it's one thing that you don't want to minimize, because sometimes the details are the only thing that you have that makes it least. Um, so the tilt stool was a piece that I created for Hayward uh, a couple years ago. And the biggest challenge of this was that when the project came to me, it was, well, we don't want to spend a lot of money on tooling. So I said, okay, well, then what if we turn this into a very simple tool? Right? It's about the use of it, about the function of it, but also it's about the beauty and to make it very elegant at the same time. So, you know, trying to keep it all as kind of one color, as one form, so you recognize it as kind of two elements, the seat and the stem and the lever. Um, so one kind of stipulation that I had was, okay, we're going to make it very simple and very easy to use. So the basic concept of this is that you can sit on it, you can raise it up and down, you can tilt forward. And you know, just like the little fellow was doing here, he can work at his desk, you know, sit the stand. So one of my criteria, my big criteria was, I don't want any visible fasteners or any visible hardware, because I want the user experience to be just this, just just what they see. You no know, other little surprises, no other little details, no other oh, this is how it went together. I wanted to be kind of a, you know, a magical experience in terms of you just feel the material and you are able to use it as as needed. The other um, detail that I thought was very important was that I didn't want to expose the gas cylinder. Now, for those of you who don't know, the gas cylinder is what, when I activate this lever, it makes it go up and down. And typically, you will see this detail in a lot of chairs or a lot of um, seating. And you would think, oh, this is kind of like you know, a gas cylinder. How is it really going to change the way that looks? But it makes a dramatic um, change in the way that you perceive it, um, in the way that you experience it, even in the way that they use it. So whether it's the quality of it or whether it's the experience, just being able to maintain you know, details of a very simple object becomes very important. And you know, it increases the experience level with products that people, especially in furniture, you're constantly touching and using. I watch people all the time use this and always touching the bottom of this. You know, they don't feel anything because the passengers aren't exposed. What ideas find you? Um, so this was a sketch that I had created several years ago, uh, which eventually led to the uh, Resonate Bookshelf, which is out in the uh, lobby over there by the two tulip chairs. And, uh, but this came from the idea of just kind of looking out the window, and I was kind of traveling from Chicago to Ohio, and I kept drawing kind of this form over, this kind of undulating form. And for me, it was kind of like the plains of Illinois, then the hills of northern Ohio, the back of the plains of Illinois, and my return. And uh, there was something about this kind of captured my eye that I didn't. So I know what it was initially. And so I started repeating it, and I thought, oh, that's very interesting, kind of creating these negative and positive shapes, and I thought that made a very interesting storage element. And what I loved about it was how it was just a simple sketch, how it was very thin, um, very elegant, very simple. And in my mind, when I looked at it, I was seeing not only the storage piece, but then what was behind it. So it wasn't about having a background storage piece. It wasn't about how many books can I put in this thing. So kind of to that point, you know, without looking at it in space, looking at it, you can start to layer these in space. And the idea that if you had it in front of something, it was able to create a divider, but also a foreground and also a background, depending on how the designer wanted to use it or how you experienced it in space. You know, looking into nature and sometimes how certain things in nature have a similar effect. So taking inspiration from that. Um, the other kind of detail that was very important was at one time, it was all kind of one color. And what I loved about the piece in the idea was that kind of this play of negative and positive shapes. Um, but I wanted to try and find a way to kind of really emphasize that. 
And so this is a photo that I took. I was out, um, I was in Ohio and taking photos of the forest during winter. And I noticed that when the wind blew, the snow only appeared on one side of the trees. And when that happened, you would flip flop the kind of the tree or the negative space to the positive space. And I thought, well, that would be something very interesting, a way to kind of highlight the inside and the outside of the piece. Um, at this point, I told a story to a group, and a woman was from California, and she said, uh, I've never seen snow before, so I have no idea what you're talking about, but it sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you can see by just you know changing the interior and exterior colors, how it really you know, changed the positive and negative space. And if you walk around it out there, you kind of notice that you look at it, the, the shapes and, uh, and the sculptural problems that change as you walk around it. Which is a shot from the Econ uh, this year. So you can see how it just, you know, it doesn't dominate. It can if you want it to, but at the same time, it can be you know, part of the backdrop. It just creates this really thin, kind of sketched line uh, in the environment. Trying new methods. Um, so during this time, I was working on a family of chairs with Michael Welsh, and who's also in our studio. And you know, when you do seating, especially really any of our furniture, it's really so detail oriented, so about controlling every little thing, um, and about the idea of perfection and precision, which is all necessary. And designers love to work on it. But at the same time, you know, I had an idea in my head of what if we kind of what if I question and do something different that kind of treats those ideas of perfection, those ideas of imperfection, those ideas of control differently. So I was actually over at um, this is at Pitch and Grand Rapids. And so I found all these you know, mounds of wood just sitting there. You know, somewhere from you know old homes, different buildings around the area, um, you know, decks that were torn down off of houses, barns, and uh, and also the wood. And I thought how interesting it was, but you really can't reuse it in the same fashion that it was intended for because of the structural issues, because of the you know, degradation between being torn down and then sitting out there after it gets rained on, you know, whatever kind of elements occur on and into the wood. So this is a, a picture of me and my shop. So I had the basic concept of, well, you can't really use it structurally, but if you bind the pieces all together, um, you can probably get enough strength by having them all be um, bound together. And so here you can see some of the process of kind of, so it's not a matter of just taking some wood and stepping it together, it's a matter of cutting everything down. I kind of cut it down to the size, because it goes from this to a CNC machine. If I wanted to, I could create a huge block of it and have it be cut, but I'm wasting on materials, a lot of excess, a lot of time to get involved. So I still have to take it from those initial pieces I found and put it into a form that is within, you know, a couple inches of the finished version. So you kind of see how it's all clamped and kind of bound together. And so with this imperfect material, I use a very precise and perfect process, which is the CC um, So, you know, this piece, you know, this is some of the wood from here with there. And what happened is, as the CNC machine would work, it would remove all those materials and things like the checking or the wear, um, the different qualities that the wood would obtain because of the natural elements, because of the life it had gone through, it had changed into something else. Uh, and each one was different because the material uh, is not, um, you know, is not consistent. Um, it's totally based on kind of obviously the material what it goes through, and also where I get it from, what kind of material is it. This is actually a little prototype um, that I did probably a year before, so like quarter scale of the rest of them, just to see if the idea would work. Right? I drew it up in my head, but you, know, you want to test things out before you go full size. Um, and from there, I actually even want to make it even simpler. I love the form of it, and I love kind of the space that you get in between the pieces and the imperfection that would happen, um, but also the checking that would occur in the material itself. So by making it black, we focus the design solely on the gaps in the space that's in between. Good one out. But uh, I did a uh, uh, collection after that where I wanted to simplify the form even more. And this collection is called Found. And the basic idea is that, uh, yes, you find the materials. That was one inspiration for the name. But the other one is that a lot of times you know, you'll be outside and you'll be like, walking the forest. And you want to take a break with like you and your friends, and so you found like a stump, and you found like a tree that's falling over, and you find a rock. So you find these things and you use them as you want to. So the idea is that the profile is the same. We're going to change it to the size. 
so you know, someone asked me earlier, you know, is this used as a side table or a stool? And I say yes. It's the same case for this. I mean, it could be a table, it could be a bench, it could be a side table, it could be a stool. So you kind of just create the pieces and you use them as needed. Um, and you can actually you know, group them together to create kind of a, you know, a, a table that has different heights to it. You can pull them apart and use them as side tables or stools or benches and such. Then we do the pews and park. My little homage to Peterson Park stacking up the stones. Um, and this is actually the same piece. So that's the one view, and this is the front view. So things like this would happen, where this is this is two pieces, you can see the seam right there. But sometimes when the CNC process works itself out, you know, it looks like it could be actually one. But these are the kind of things that you can plan for. These are the kind of things that occur through um, the process. So the beauty in the end was kind of the imperfection. So it's imperfect material. Um, being molded and being uh, refined by a um, very precise, very perfect process. So a couple um, points here. So avoid the cliches. So we hear this a lot, form versus function, form follows function. And I always thought it was interesting because I feel like when we talk about minimizing or simplifying, um, when you say, when you say like form versus function or form follows function, you're in some sense saying that they're kind of black and white. And nothing can be put on part black and white. So you spend the entire time as designers, the idea of being these kind of things closer together, closer together, closer together. And so rather than work in the black and white, you know, I would suggest working in the gray. And because we don't know that one here, you know, work, you know, form is here and function is here. They could be, you know, form could be 40% gray and function could be 60% gray, a lot closer than black and white. Um, and even, you know, the Harvard work on I worked on, when I started this project, the idea of form versus first, first function wasn't even in my head. But I'm sure a lot of people who look at it, I like hear it at Neocon, you know, they see, oh yes, form versus function. I see how this is the function part of the form part. Like, okay, but when I started it, it was I did not think, you know, anything about that. And now that I look back at it, I think had I started thinking in my own mind about, oh, this is form versus function, I think I would have been in the wrong place. It was about creating a holistic solution, not about creating part pieces that would then brought together. Um, so the basic idea of this is today, you know, as you leave our desks from, from work, and no matter whether you're in a private space or an atrium, or you're seeing, you know, GR all the time, cafes, um, kind of pub workspaces, you kind of work everywhere and anywhere, but you always bring your stuff with you when you leave. Um, you know, you see this kind of people meeting and things about the floor or on your lap, you know, you're at home and you have, you know, the computer on your, in your lap, your drink is on a table next to you, or even if you use a lounge chair, you know, stuff on the floor, you're trying to wedge your other things next to you on the side, and if there's a tablet on the lounge chair, okay, well, that's good, that's where my computer goes, but then where does everything, everything else go? So I'm not gonna go through all this, but this is kind of some of the basic breakdown in terms of how this fit, where we were looking, you know, market trends and shifts, uh, how people were working and how it was different then and today, and kind of spaces that people are doing this type of, or where this project is appropriate for today. Um, but really what I was more interested in are kind of these, these emotive icons down here, um, which is really about how we communicate, how we converse, how we collaborate, um, and you know, what types of things do we bring with us. And it's not just tools, right? The tools aren't just the laptop or the tablet or the iPhone, but they're also your bag, your headphones, you know, your cup of coffee that you might need in the morning or some other time during the day. And so, but I really wanted was to truly support the user. And this is kind of where one of the ideas of the form came from, was kind of the idea of the hand, kind of holding the user, supporting the user um, throughout their day, through their work time. And so it's kind of some of the development. So initially, you know, it, it did kind of come across as a hybrid. The basic concept started as, you know, I'm bringing kind of tasks, I'm bringing lounge together. Um, even the angles of the back and of the seat are hybrid. So the back is reclined enough to be be lounging and comfortable, but upright enough to be focused and be able to work on the tablet. The depth and the height of the seat is so that if you're worst tree stuff, you're five feet tall, you can put your feet on the floor, but if you're six foot four, your legs don't hit the tablet from the underside. And luckily Teresa's, you know, five footish and Michael Welsh, who I work with, is six foot four, so I'm gonna use both of them uh, in doing the studies and the research. Um, but you know, I really want to kind of and, 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 and I, I refer to it as this mono form, right? This continuous kind of softened pebble like shape. Because minimal isn't just about creating like very simple, very straight lines. A lot of times those end up being uh, more aggressive and harder to understand because your eye kind of goes from point to point. 
It's also about you know, letting your eye kind of flow around the surface um, and letting it continue and being easy to look at. And so what was important was I had a primary space where you could work and a secondary space where you could put your other things. And it's important too that there are different heights because you'll notice this probably at home or in the office, you might have one table and you might be working on something so you push your work off to the side. But it's still in your periphery, it's still there. And because it's still there in your periphery, you still kind of acknowledge it, you never really actually get it truly off to the side. So the fact that you're able to kind of put it below or next to you kind of gives you this hierarchy of here's what I'm working on, here's what my kind of roughest you know, material is. Um, and also, you know, the stool can be used as a stool or some ottoman, it goes up and down as well. There's even a cup holder on the ottoman as well for guests or if you just want to be able to take your stuff and pop the room or put it onto the ottoman. So I really, you know, the goal was I wanted to kind of add all this usefulness to it, um, the ability for the user to kind of have it adapt to them, but it was also about making it very kind of emotive um, and something that you really wanted to you know, kind of be in. You would want to have not only in the office, but also uh, in your home. So this is showing some of the initial prototypes um, and you know, simple plywood forms. Uh, because it's a Hayward product, we have to go globally around the world and it has to satisfy all the standards, so business standards. So you know, if a high school or college kid decides to you know, stand on it, what's gonna happen? That's a 150 pound weight that's put on there. And when it's taken off, it actually you know, springs back up, you know, into uh, position. And we have to pull it back a thousand times to make sure that in 10 years it's not gonna fail. So along with, you know, keeping it very simple, keeping it elegant, keeping it minimal, it also has to satisfy all these durability testing that we have to go through to satisfy for quality purposes. Do my own testing. Uh, this is, you know, part of the development process, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very um, additive process, but then it gets to a point where you're doing a lot of editing because it's easy to, to kind of go too far. And you know, in the process of the Harbor Lounge, it was very much about you know keeping things. You know, when you take that tablet off, it works, but it also feels like it's meant to be there. So it's kind of showing the different iterations of the bases and the tablet. Kind of the final photography that was used. So whether it's kind of personal, whether it's a small group, or whether it's thank you, uh, kind of studios with photos here, it's lovely, beautiful space. Um, whether it's a collaborative space for technology, you know, whether it's a private office, whether they're at home, it kind of fits like it belongs, you know, have it home to have it safe. Uh, and then, you know, this was very important from the beginning, I had the idea of these top views, and you know, it illustrates all different types of work that can be done all the different types of workers that can use it. Um, and it wasn't so much about share, it was more about space, right? So it was about the space for you, the space that you work, the space for your stuff, the space for your labs. So in closing, I'll leave my quote by Henry Watson Longfellow, in all the things, the supreme excellence is the Thank you. Three or four questions. Um, and to kick that off, I'd like to ask Nikolai a question. You talked about the Harbor Work Lounge and the found product, and with the namings of those products, is that something that you do with a team or other designers at Hayworth, or what's that process like? Um, yeah, I mean, for my own personal stuff, you know, that was, you know, pitch, the whole thing is like you're going away, so it's length of pitch. I think pitch is also something that's in wood that kind of keeps it bound together, so that one kind of worked out. Um, in terms of like the Hayward products, for example, it's a very extensive process because we offer products globally and there's issues in terms of like you know, copyright, who owns your rights to names. And so, I mean, typically we'll start the process of naming um, probably I don't know, six to eight months before the project is going to go out and it can potentially catch a take that long because it goes through all these iterations of finding names that fit, names that aren't taken. Um, you know, so on and so forth. It's, it's funny too, because there's a lot of brands out there that will name something, they don't trademark it. So there's research done into that too, in terms of like, oh, this one's actually used by the product, but they don't own it. So technically we can use it, but if we use it and then do a Google search, their product might come up as devourers. So it's a very kind of extensive long process, longer than one might think. Again, right, the simple, the simple thing has to take a lot longer than you might you know, imagine. Question? I 
think there's something important. <coughs> if we had names for other things, like I think the family of shares would like interact. And I know people in the past have named things according to like their kids are a cartoon character or you know other, other things like that. But uh, yeah, I think in that case, we just kind of worked on it just because kind of what it did. Right? I mean, I'm sure for the end it's going to end up with a name or not. Can you talk a little about the design process at like the furniture company, for example? Sure. Like, are you commissioned to do a very specific project? Okay. Can you come up with something in that category, or are you kind of like free to explore? So here, one of the reasons why I came to Hayworth was um, there's a lot of room for a designer to kind of have their own influences. And some brands are very set in kind of who they are, and so you kind of are driven to do certain things or a certain way. Um, here, yes, or is, as just mentioned, is kind of an, an idea of how we approach things, but we're still um, at a stage we're kind of defining who we are. So, um, so your, your answer, it, it kind of depends. Um, some programs are kind of more market-driven. It might be things like, um, you know, uh, we have a gap here, or we need to compete with this or kind of kind of response, or to talk about data that needs to be kind of replaced. Um, the, uh, like Harbor actually came directly from our studio where uh, we kind of dedicate some time to kind of kind of think three to five, ten years out. So sometimes those things actually seem more relevant than we originally thought they were because we base it on we're seeing the trends that are happening. And you try not to uh, like, um, try to limit yourself too early. So in doing so, you have a lot of ideas, most of which never ever happen, right? I mean, I have a wall, all of us have a wall of stuff that we'll never see by a day other than our own mind and hearts. Um, but in terms of production, you know, it might not happen. So in the case of Harvard, it was definitely more internal from the design studio, but um, it can kind of go both, both ways. When you pursue minimalism in your design, how do you protect yourself from like reducing things too much or stripping away? Like sure. where's that line of where it lost its original goals or value? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I would say two things. I would say one, I don't necessarily call myself like a minimalist designer, um, only because I feel like sometimes uh, putting yourself into that box or that style um, isn't fair to your process, isn't fair to the product, because you're trying too hard to like satisfy that idea. Right. Um, so that's kind of one thing. Other one is, it's part of like, so when I was studying school, I almost transferred out of design to sculpture. What I love about sculpture is kind of this edited editing process of adding, reducing, adding, reducing. So I kind of use the same process when it comes to um, creating design. And it's actually a pretty cool feeling when you take something away and it actually feels better. And I think a lot of it is more feeling than just than just looks. A lot of it's about the story of it. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's one of those things where you're, you are having to do, you know, like you saw before, the, uh, on the, floor, all the, the layout of all the parts and pieces. And I think the more you do of it, the better you get at recognizing what is important and what isn't. But at the same time, it is kind of that constant work you're putting into it. Um, and uh, it's just kind of, you know, as um, uh, Morrison, as I was showing, kind of talked about the importance of you know, a designer being able to edit. Um, but a lot of that comes with just, I think, just you know, practice. And there was a, I think Julia actually sent to me, it was a talk about um, the gentleman that told stories in NPR. Um, What's his name? Someone help me. Um, what was it? Ira Glass, thank you, yes, Ira Glass. And he talked about how your level of taste always needs to be above that of what you're doing. Because if it isn't, then you won't recognize where it needs to be or where it should be at. So I think that's part of the process too, is always looking at yourself and looking at others in a way more from learning as much as copying, because that could be the danger. You know, you see a lot of things today, if you go to Salone, if you go to ICFF, other things, you see a lot of iterative things that are just copied. And um, with the way the web is today, you know, people just want to satisfy like today's blog, today's update. And so everything and anything is put on there. And so all of a sudden that's become the way of curating things, the way of putting a stamp of approval. I think that's very dangerous too because they're just there to satisfy you know, new things and new updates. And they're not necessarily looking at what is actually making a real impact you know, in our world today. That's kind of obviously a bigger statement to make, but um, you know, even things that you do, you know, furniture, things that maybe don't seem as you know, as big or as global 
from, you know, oh, it's the chair, or it's just, you know, it's just, you know, it's the jewelry or something. Those come from bigger ideas, and then you put it, you know, they abstract it into that, you know, more of a realized product. Just a, a quick question on, you were talking about what ideas find you. Sure. Could you expound? Yeah, it's a hard one to sell to clients if you're uh, working as a consultant. It's like, I'll, 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 I'll give it back to you. I'm just waiting for them to come to me. Um, I think it goes back a little bit to kind of forcing your hand into a product or, or into an idea. Like, you might have some preconceived ideas of how it's going to be and what it's going to be. Um, a lot of the things that I designed and even some of like the, the forms of the harbor were just kind of sitting there and just kind of, I guess it would be almost kind of like your. Um, Thinking of what you want it to be, and letting your hand kind of take a kind of foul path without um, trying to let your own interpretations or your own um, experience kind of drive what's happening. If that makes sense, right? So, you know, it's kind of the thing where you go on a trip and you end up paying much better time when you just kind of go off the road just find the map, right? So, I think it's, it's kind of that mentality of, of um, just kind of letting it happen as it happens. And the hard part, of course, is recognizing. Right, when you see it. And I think that just comes through practice and it comes through um, just kind of being open to the opportunity. Because um, yeah, I know for myself, a lot of times, it's, you find it hard to kind of force these things to be versus kind of what, what it is. 